Wow. Stilhed før stormen. <laughs> It's very loud. Um, great to see so many today. Uh, have there ever, ever been so many people in this room? No. no. <laughs> great. Um, a Danish scientist receiving a Nobel Prize is very special. That's why today is also a very special day at SDU, because the first Danish Nobel Prize winner in 25 years is here. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Morten Mildahl, Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, to the Dias Nobel Colloquium. Huge congratulations to you and your colleagues on the press. Thank you. We have been very much looking forward to your visit, uh, and we have been particularly looking forward actually to learn more about the discovery of the click chemistry, and of course your path to the highest professional recognition a scientist can achieve. My feeling though is that you dream more about chemistry than awards. Uh, and that's an imp important point to make today. A strong desire to solve problems, openness to other disciplines, the ability to have fun in the lab and dream of discoveries, not only at night, but maybe also during the day. Those are essential qualities if we want to succeed in making the kind of discoveries that really propel the technology forward. It's, my clear, um, it's clear to me that you're deeply committed to passing on your curiosity and scientific results to the future generation. That was also clear from our discussion uh, some minutes ago. Um, and that dedication was clear also when you, early in the morning after you were awarded, the Nobel Prize was back in the classroom. So thanks for being a tremendous role model Um, a successful scientist hand in hand with a, an enthusiastic teacher. You and your cutting edge research are a huge inspiration to the students who will be shaping our future. Uh, and this close link between education and research is absolutely crucial to our universities and our study programs. The simplicity and great utility of your discovery Uh, of click chemistry was cited by the Nobel Committee as an important part of the rationale for awarding you the Nobel Prize. And it reminds us that the application of science is absolutely crucial in a time when the crises are lining up. It also reminds us that basic research can lead to solving complex challenges such as uh, problems of food waste and the development of more effective medicines. Ultimately, it serves as a reminder that by utilizing the knowledge that you and many of you uh, in this room are tirelessly working to uncover every day, we actually have the power to improve the world around us. So once again, Morten, many congratulations on the Nobel Prize and my warmest wishes for this uh, tremendous colloquium today. Uh, and thank you for your attention. And then, I also have a gift for you. Since uh, it may be necessary to replace <laughs> <laughs> this uh, tremendous shirt from University of Copenhagen. You are not the only <laughs> <laughs> We can line up then. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you uh, for this very, very kind introduction. Uh, yes, uh, and I'm Morten, actually, uh, I'm going to say a few words as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, uh, sorry for that. So, uh, yeah. um, yes, so, so um, my name is Marianne Holmer, and I'm the Dean at the Faculty of Science, and I'm, of course, very thrilled that there's uh, so much attention now uh, on chemistry, and it's very nice uh, to see so many of you here today, both young and uh, elderly. So, uh, <laughs> um, not old, though. Yeah, not old. No, no. I was thinking. Well, here I was referring to students and researchers because I think it's uh, not only for the students, but it's also for researchers in chemistry uh, that we are suffering a little bit uh, on on the 
interest in chemistry. So I hope with the Nobel Prize that we will gain more uh, interest in chemistry in general. And Morten, I was going to tell a little bit about your impressive CV. Uh, and uh, you are now a professor and has been for many years at the University of Copenhagen. And you are um, leading uh, this uh, Center of Evolutionary Chemical Biology. So covering many uh, wordings from uh, natural science. Uh, so I'm, I'm also very pleased uh, by that. But actually, you have your education from DTU, so the Danish uh, Technical uh, University. You are an engineer. Um, and also your PhD was a leak tech, as we just talked about, but it's the same as a PhD. And you have that from DTU as well. And uh, then after some postdoc years at DTU, you uh, went to Copenhagen and got uh, to know uh, a little bit more about the fundamental chemistry at Copenhagen University. And then uh, half a year in Cambridge, where I think you learned uh, something about internationalization and also this to, uh, to work with your own ideas. Um, you returned to the Spock Center at the Carlsberg Laboratory uh, after that. And then from 2011, you have been a uh, full professor at the, the Department of Chemistry at the uh, Copenhagen University. Um, in addition to, to this, you have also uh, several awards from uh, both national and international societies. You were ranked uh, among the top three. In the, for the Nobel Prize, uh, as I understand it, in 2019, and then you succeeded in, in uh, 2022, I believe, the, that you got it. Um, so that's really amazing. Um, then you have also had several uh, large grants, of course, so you have had a DNRF center, and I believe that that was actually what helped you uh, to really develop the click uh, chemistry. And again, this is some basic funding with, with a lot of freedom. Um, then uh, what, and I think maybe that could be back to your engineering. Uh, you have also been co-founding uh, at least three companies, uh, so small startup companies in, in chemistry, I believe, uh, using some of your uh, research and bringing that out to the society as well. Um, so, uh, in the yeah, order of keeping this uh, relatively short, then uh, just to round up, then you also have published more than 300 publications in high-ranking journals, I believe, um, and then you hold uh, 21 patents. So, um, this is amazing and uh, so well deserved with the Nobel Prize. Um, and now, I'll give the <laughs> microphone to you, and we are looking very much forward to your talk. So, I'm in very good company here. Very good company here, uh, but I'm missing someone, and that is our own uh, Nils Bohr, who uh, were working together with this gentleman uh, for many years, and actually 100 years ago received the Nobel Prize uh, because of his discoveries. He is uh, one of the most important Danes, of course, uh, and you should have a post of him, I think. <laughs> even though he is from University of Copenhagen. <laughs> so, uh, on the 5th of October last year, I was preparing videos for the students and suddenly the telephone rang and I took the telephone and it was uh, a Swedish voice uh, with English accent, or opposite. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, um, they congratulated, or they said that they were going to announce me as Nobel laureate. And I thought, immediately I thought, well, now they are making another joke on me from the fourth floor, because they did that in 19. <laughs> uh, but it was okay. Uh, it was true. And uh, I am very, very honored 
uh, on behalf of all the people who worked in this area that the Nobel Committee has pointed towards click chemistry uh, to set a trend in the future for a new development of chemistries. And I'll come back to why I think chemistry, like click chemistry, is very important for us in the future. I didn't receive that alone. Uh, I received it uh, together with Barry Sharpless and Carolyn Patosi, two good friends for me. I know Carolyn Patosi since she was young, just finished as a PhD. I met her at the ACS symposium. We discussed a long time about how to do carbohydrates and what biochemistry of carbohydrates and so on, because I started out in carbohydrates myself. And uh, uh, sort of a friendship that developed. And, and Barry, I have, uh, I have visited him twice in the lab. I have small vials from his first Nobel Prize in my lab. Uh, so these two kind of reagents that he used for epoxidations and dehydroxylations, I have those in my lab. But on the 5th of October, I got this call, and in December, I was invited to Stockholm to receive the Nobel Prize. First, you give this lecture. It's a very intimidating moment, <laughs> because uh, millions of people are looking at that. So um, after that, uh, we had the ceremony uh, where I was uh, given this prize by the king of Sweden. And uh, this is what it looks like. And this is a lecture the day after. This is my principal now, always a lecture the day after. So uh, where did I get this inspiration for chemistry? This is one of the things that uh, I'm always asked. And really it was my parents uh, who always uh, gave me a hammer and a saw and a wrench and so on in my hands. But also they took me into nature. So this is a picture from my grandparents' farm. Uh, and uh, I spent a third of my life on this farm. It was really a fantastic childhood, very privileged. Uh, so I was building uh, huts and uh, crawling trees and looking at animals and so on. And this is what I looked like then, believe it or not. Uh, very interested in what was around there, in the forest, in the beaches. Fantastic place to, to grow up. So uh, later on, I had to choose between uh, the different disciplines, and I chose chemistry. And the reason is, of course, sorry, here, chemistry is everything. And really think about it. Is there anything around you that is not chemistry, that you can see, touch, feel, everything? has a chemical content, or is chemistry, is at, built of atoms. So it's extremely important that we consider this more now than ever when we have all these uh, global problems. So uh, we should be able to do uh, research without restraints and inspire our young people. And I think uh, this is uh, very, uh, three very important mantras that I have developed. Because when you get a Nobel Prize, you become a communication channel. And uh, what you say is suddenly always true, for some reason. <laughs> so just believe me, this is true. <laughs> and uh, at uh, this place, which is uh, Carlsberg Laboratory, I was later on uh, allowed to uh, do research. And I got uh, this book, Limits to Growth, which already then predicted all the global challenges we have today. And this is actually one of the reasons I chose chemistry, because I thought those solutions that we need for that problem is going to be in chemistry. I really advise you to read that book, which in the 80s already predicted that it will go exactly as it has gone. And we have all the problems that they predicted in this book. Uh, it was looked at as some leftish uh, no, propaganda. It's not. And uh, we established the Spock Center. Uh, it was uh, financed by the Danish National Research Foundation, and uh, I was starting in Carlsberg Laboratory in 1997 with a strong focus on uh, quantitative chemical reactions or transformations. 
The reason that uh, came up was uh, because of combinatorial chemistry, which was a new kind of thing that happened in the 90s all over the world. And in this uh, combinatorial chemistry, you make millions of compounds. If you have sloppy reactions, you're not going to succeed. So we were looking for organic reactions which were quantitative and behaved just like click chemistry within carbohydrates, peptides, and proteins. So we would like to combine organic chemistry with these uh, areas. Uh, so what is combinatorial chemistry? We use the so-called OBOC method, one beat, one compound method, which is an exponentially growing uh, number of compounds that you form by taking a resin, small plastic beads, and you do the chemistry on those. Uh, and you do it in separate reactors, different chemistries in each reactor. Then you combine them and shake them up like that, and you put them out in a new, uh, new containers and react the second step and the third step. And each compound, uh, each uh, bead will contain only one compound. So this is illustrated here. We have these uh, four beads in the containers here. And uh, then we come in with a reagent. It uh, reacts, uh, and uh, we mix them up in a container. And uh, we divide them out again in uh, these containers, come with a second reagent. And you can see now each uh, bead here will contain only one uh, compound. So if we have uh, three steps and three uh, different reaction uh, uh, reagents, uh, we get uh, 27 different compounds. If we have five and uh, five steps, we get uh, 3,000 compounds and so on. So we can very rapidly build millions of compounds in this way. And then we can test these compounds. So this is what we do practically. We have this kind of well system where we do the reactions. We turn it around and shake it like in the bar. And then we put it back uh, upside down and then put it back uh, upright and you do the next reaction. So it's very quick. In a week, we can make, make millions of compounds. And then we can add, uh, for example, an enzyme or a re receptor or something that's labeled, a protein that's labeled, and it will attach itself to the bead or do a reaction on the bead. And uh, then we can isolate those that uh, show reactivity and find out what was this activity due to. So uh, using this method, we were working, a lot of people in the lab, on uh, developing reactions within Vitic, within just order within uh, starting our uh, reductive aminations, INYAC reactions. Uh, there's so many different reactions that we tried. Uh, it wasn't the click reaction yet, but uh, during this process, uh, we were also working with acetoacid chlorides because these are very small on the amino group, uh, like an acide. And they can be used in very difficult reactions, like uh, we were the first one to synthesize uh, this kind of compound, which is very sterically hindered. Um, and we thought we can use these acetoacid chlorides for other things. For example, we could uh, acylate this copper uh, acetylate here to make a ketoalkyne. That would be very useful for us to click on things uh, by Gilles order on the side chain of uh, like a branching point for peptides. So uh, I had a PhD student, Christian Vincent Toner, who worked at this intensively. He's a very good student, but he just could not make this happen. It was so difficult. Uh, and uh, he tried for several months and he came and said to me he wanted to do something else. He didn't want to do his PhD study. Uh, and I said, uh, hold your horses, because then we looked at it because uh, what formed was this one, and it formed quantitatively in the presence of this very reactive acid chloride. And after this reaction, we could then react it with other things, nucleophiles on the acid chloride. So that uh, was actually a very nice uh, realization. And uh, we were, because of this uh, uh, DG uh, funding that we had, we were able to completely change our tracks and focus on this. So there were two people in the lab focusing on that. And after a year, Christian uh, could go to, uh, uh, to the American Peptide Symposium and present this in 2001. 
Uh, and uh, he had shown that it was completely compatible with all the functionalities you have in proteins. So that was a very good uh, time. So now we have this large toolbox that uh, everyone here who is a chemist uses every day. Uh, and uh, it's a nice toolbox, but it's also quite uh, disturbing how much solvent we use and how much uh, we are messing up the world uh, in uh, uh, large-scale production using this toolbox with organic chemistry. And then we have this small, nice uh, toolbox with uh, click reactions. There are today three click reactions. After 23 years, we have three uh, click reactions. We have the original QRG reaction, and then this is Carolyn Batosi's reaction, which is copper-free. And then we have uh, this reaction between tetracine and cyclooctene. These three reactions fulfill all the criteria for click, uh, which are, for example, that you have to be able to do the reaction in water. You have to be able to do the reaction selectively or orthogonally uh, with all the other chemistries around. Uh, you have to do it at very low concentrations, uh, and uh, so on. So there's a number of criteria here that are very important for calling this a click reaction. Uh, I think we should look for more of these reactions because if we get a large set of those, we can actually do much, much more than we can today. Here's an example of a drug that is in clinic, two drugs that are in clinic for fibrosis, and they are synthesized essentially in water. Uh, so a pharmaceutical production of complex molecules like this occurring in water, very nice. Uh, and uh, they are, in, the, in, as I said, in clinical studies, so probably later this year, next year, you will see these on the, on the market. And what you can see is that over here, for example, you have a carbohydrate, a simple carbohydrate here, the thioglycoside here in the middle, and then you have uh, an acide here for a two amino sugar that has been converted into an acide and then reacted with this moiety. And here you have a three amino sugar converted into an A site and reacted with this moiety. So uh, that's very nice. Uh, but that's not what we got the prize for. What we got the prize for was the fact that you can combine molecular functionality. So we can take any kind of biomolecule and we can link it together with other biomolecules if we have the right. Uh, uh, entities on these biomolecules. So here we have a, a guy that can kill cells by apoptosis. Uh, we have a monoclonal antibody that can locate some tumor tissue. We have a, a cell penetrating peptide. If we uh, express those or synthesize them with acides and alkynes in the amino acids that it's composed of, then we can just uh, take those uh, three guys and uh, mix them in a jar with a cup of one and uh, wait for a couple of hours uh, while they steer around and we get a quantitative formation of, uh, of this uh, product. Uh, now uh, we have uh, these three functionalities and uh, then uh, we can look at what uh, they do. So we have a monoclonal antibody that swims around and search out your body for cancer cells. It sits on the cancer cell and the cell penetrating peptide drags the other guys inside the cell and the apoptosis makes sure that uh, we get rid of it. So that's uh, the, the reason, the argument for, for giving the prize to click chemistry. So this is a click reaction. Uh, it's uh, used everywhere. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're in medicinal chemistry, in diagnostics, in biochemistry, surface chemistry, or so on. You will uh, use click chemistry at some point of your career. Uh, because click is good, click is green, and click is selective. So what is it really? Uh, this is an alkyne. An alkyne is really just a big bag of electrons. So it has these uh, pi orbitals that sits on top and on the sides there. And uh, one of these uh, uh, orbitals is shown here, full of electrons. 
So it's like a nucleophile, and it uh, looks for a positive charge. So if we come with copper one, uh, copper one has a tendency to bind very strongly to alkynes. When it does that, it uh, sucks out the electron density from down here, and this becomes very acidic, and the copper takes the place of the proton. So we get this one, and that's not enough. We need another one to come in and help it. So uh, we have a copper uh, one coming in here, and it sits on the electron cloud, and it uh, peels off like you open a, a can of sardines, peels off the electrons, get into the positive charge, of the alkyne, because now we have the two positive uh, copper atoms. Uh, so we get these, uh, this is the empty orbitals, and they're really looking for electron density. Uh, where does it find that? Uh, well, fortunately, there's an A site, which is a completely orthogonal functionality, it doesn't exist in nature. It uh, comes uh, uh, running in here from uh, the right, and uh, it fits exactly with the orbital geometry of the empty orbitals here. So it can uh, transfer the electron density to the alkyne, and first we get uh, the metallocene, and then that loose first one copper atom, and then the second copper atom. At this point, we can actually use that as a metalloorganic reagent here. So this is a product. Is it interesting? But uh, we have connected these two functionalities, this one and this one, quantitatively from one-to-one -one reaction. So um, the thing is, we can do this with very complex molecules. Here is a, a complex molecule for cancer recognition and cell penetration that we have linked together with a triazole. Boom, like that, unprotected. <coughs> uh, so there's only one issue with the click reaction, and that is the redox issue. The redox issue was not realized in the beginning. so. Uh, the first publication from Sharpless group actually suggests that you take a reducing agent and you just bombard the copper with the reducing agent, so it will always give you some copper one. But that is a real problem. So this is a cycle. Uh, we have the copper one, it oxidizes to copper two with oxygen, and then you just reduce it back with ascorbate. It looks fine, and it works fine if you have no sensitive uh, parts of your molecule. But the problem is that this is what you generate in the process. So all of these, as you might recognize, all of these are very reactive species, reactive oxygen species, as they are called. And they actually destroy your, your molecules. So we worked with a lot of proteins and so on to click them together, and this is the serious byproduct of site reactions. So you have to completely avoid oxygen in these reactions and uh, the redox cycles that are associated with that. And also you use protective catalysts to sort of hold on to your cover one. Now what can we use it for? Here's an example. Uh, we realized very early on that we can use this for uh, disulfide bond mimetics. So cyclizing peptides, cyclizing proteins, and so on. And this is one example uh, in which uh, we are looking at obesity uh, via the melanocortin receptors. This is a very active research area even now, and no, Novo Nordisk is working on, on this problem very intensely for obesity. So microcyclization is, of course, a very nice thing because we can uh, rigidify our ligands so that they fit exactly into their receptors. And this is done here. Uh, we get a 21-membered ring quantitatively uh, in this reaction. <coughs> and this is what it looks like. So we have these three pharmacophores, uh, so to speak, that sits into the receptor and uh, does the activation. And depending exactly on the nature of the cycle, we get different results. We actually uh, worked on this. So here you see the receptor, uh, which is involved in obesity, growth, sexual dysfunction, memory, and so on. These are the uh, melanocortin receptors. And then melanocortin melanin cortin 4 is particularly important for obesity. Uh, so we uh, expressed this uh, receptor in cells, and we tested our compounds, and uh, they bound out here in the 
on the outside of the cell and we get the uh, communication to the inside where we have a G-coupled protein. And uh, this is what we did. We took uh, this cycle and we changed all of these uh, elements to different things, alanines and uh, other, other things, a longer chain here. And we found uh, the most active uh, compounds, uh, which can then bind to the receptor, and uh, it sends a signal via cyclic AMP uh, to the CREP, uh, <coughs> the Cree binding protein here on the DNA, and that uh, makes a down downstream uh, expression of proteins, including uh, yellow fluorescent protein. So what we do is we take our ligand, put it into the receptor, and we get a fluorescent signal that we can monitor. <coughs> and this is what it looks like uh, when we have zero ligand, more ligand, more ligand, and more ligand. And uh, we get a very nice uh, uh, readout, as you can see from these curves. So that tells us something about uh, what is reactive and what is not. And uh, we were able to make very selective uh, ligands for metanocortin-4 receptors in spite of the fact that they bind to the same uh, endogenous uh, peptide. So we can uh, usually modulate the signaling formula in a quotient 4 here, uh, selectively with a 230-fold, I think it is, or 300-fold uh, difference uh, to MC3 receptor and MC5 receptor. Here's another example. Uh, this is a uh, creature that has lived here on Earth unchanged for 400 million years. And the reason it has been here for so long unchanged is probably its immune system. It has a unique innate immune system. Uh, we actually harvest this because it entraps bacteria. So it is used as a monitoring agent for seeing if you have bacteria in the blood. So you actually catch these, line them up in arrays, and bleed them. Uh, they have eight eyes around the, the body, and they look like tanks. So they are uh, very good animals. But one of the things they also do is when they entrap the bacteria, they inject these uh, beta hairpins uh, into the bacteria, and they are very toxic for the bacteria. So they are antibacterial. And uh, they look like this. They have two disulfide bonds. We thought maybe we can just replace those with the uh, triosols. Uh, and make something that is uh, biologically inert. Uh, it cannot be changed uh, by disulfide uh, reduction, for example. And when we were working with this, we also observed that they actually form a dimer in solution like that with uh, all the uh, noxious lipophilic uh, parts sitting here in the middle. So these uh, cannonballs with uh, positive charge on the surface uh, swim around. And then when they hit the negatively charged cell membrane, uh, they open up and they form a pore. And through this pore, all the in in content of the cell, uh, it uh, comes out through the pore and uh, the cell uh, will eventually uh, not survive that. So, uh, so that's uh, what happens here from the Japanese horseshoe crab. Uh, and we would then uh, like to see if that really works. So we tried different bacteria, coli, uh, Staphylococcus epidemis, uh, Salmonella trifimurium, and Bacillus subtilis. And you can see uh, the natural, bacteria, uh, the natural uh, uh, antibacterial peptide uh, works for three of them, but it doesn't work at all for this uh, Bacillus subtilis. Whereas our compounds, they work uh, across all of them. And uh, this is uh, probably due to the fact that this uh, Bacillus subtilis can reduce uh, the disulfide bonds. Is, uh, our, uh, we don't know, but we think that is why. So you can say that click is good for antimicrobial uh, peptides. Uh, we then uh, also have tried for many years to express proteases, and that's really serious business. It's very difficult to do. And the reason is, of course, that if you have a protease or proteolytic enzyme, this will cleave not only uh, its own substrates where it comes from, but also substrates inside the cells. So if you put this uh, enzyme in large concentrations into a coli bacterium, it will uh, cleave 
everything inside the cooler. And uh, what happens is that you usually get a short period of a little bit of expression, and then it dies out. So uh, cooler are very unhappy with this uh, process. They don't survive very well. And uh, we thought maybe we can take a pair of scissors and cut this in two and express it with the A-side and the alkyne uh, in the sequence. <coughs> So that's what we are doing here. We express it uh, in two jars in uh, nice structures here uh, with the A-side and the alkyne inserted by what is called amber stop codon suppression. So we take the stop codons in the DNA and we use those for introduction of an amino acids. So we ask, are you happy now? And the cola is very happy with this situation. We get large amounts of the peptides and we can do the activation immediately. So the question is, is this an, uh, an active uh, protease uh, that we have made? And uh, the answer is, when we click this, uh, like that, so the copper comes in and we click it, uh, we get the protease and we then can monitor the activity and we find that it's actually a little bit more active than the natural TED protease. So that was very cool. An example here on uh, use in HIV. Uh, so uh, here uh, we want to see if we can inhibit this process that is shown here, which is uh, viruses entering and uh, budding out from uh, a CD4 cell. So this is uh, the HIV uh, process that we want to inhibit. And the way that it uh, happens uh, is by the GP120, GP41, uh, connecting to the CD4 receptor uh, then a uh, co-receptor is uh, attaching and the uh, GP120 is sort of spreading out, allowing the GP41 to form a hexahelix. And uh, this is what we want to inhibit, the formation of this hexahelix. And how can we do that? So um, Christoph Starch synthesized this fantastic protein, as you will see. It uh, contains here... Uh, did I... Yeah, I spent a little too. So this is the hexahelix, and uh, this is what it does. It forms the uh, hexahelix, and that draws uh, apart the membrane, and the virus content is going into the cell. So uh, Christoph, uh, Christoph Starch uh, synthesized uh, this fluorophore sitting on a lysine and a template that fits exactly with this uh, central uh, triple helix. So we could click those three on and make a small protein like that. This is what it looks like as a cartoon, and this is what it is in reality. And now we have the three natural uh, helices sitting on the surface, and we just replace uh, one of those with a peptide, which is a beta hairpin that we have designed in a computer towards this. So the question is, is this a good ligand for our uh, hexahelix? Uh, if it is, it might replace the green one here. And uh, we uh, took a bead and synthesized uh, the uh, beta hairpin, and then we had this fluorophore labeled uh, triple helix that we could add. And we add it here, and when it binds, uh, we get a fluorescent bead. So we can take the fluorescent bead and uh, uh, find out uh, what kind of affinity we have. And uh, we did, did that by comparing the natural uh, triple helix, uh, the, the natural uh, binding uh, to the tri triple helix uh, with our uh, fluorophore labeled uh, triple helix uh, here, and then um, the bead without any peptides. So this here is the normal triple, uh, the normal helix sitting here binding to that uh, molecule, and this here is this beta hairpin binding to that molecule. So you can see the binding is actually better, and uh, Christoph is coming back this uh, summer to complete this study, because we think there's really a, a lot of potential here. Here we have an example where we use click chemistry to modify surfaces. That's another very big area for click chemistry. Uh, so we started out by uh, identifying by combinatorial chemistry these uh, ligands that bind to cell surfaces very strongly. Uh, so we can actually bind cells. Here is shown uh, 
different types of cells, HEC uh, cells um, and uh, Yokut cells that uh, bind uh, very strongly to, to ligands on these uh, beads. And you can see they sit almost with military uh, precision on, on the surface here. So we took those and uh, uh, we then uh, used click chemistry to immobilize them on <coughs> a uh, silicon surface. First we have this aptus uh, A site, you can see it here, and then that couples with an alkyne sitting in our adhesion peptide. That is quantitative, and when we put that into a flow cell here, and uh, we then uh, flow liquid across it for 25 centimeters per minute, you can see with anything without this adhesion peptide, we wash out the cells immediately. They are gone after a few minutes, actually. They're completely clean from cells. Whereas down here, you can see the cell sticks, and they stick in such a fashion that we can actually measure from image to image. So we can do infusion in cells in this way uh, now by click chemistry. So uh, Carolyn's approach to click chemistry uh, is without the copper one. And this is shown here, how that works. It's simply, uh, if you go back here, uh, couples uh, by bending the A site, it reacts with this strained alkyne and uh, here's the product. There's a lot of different uh, reactivities of these alkynes out there, uh, and uh, many are published by other than, uh, uh, than Caroline, but uh, she was definitely the first one that came on this idea. It stems back from a reaction uh, published first in 1961, uh, but it's uh, used here uh, with great precision, and uh, she's able to do labeling of uh, uh, cells, uh, particular cancer cells, uh, very efficiently. So uh, here's another type of click chemistry, the INIAC reaction. This is uh, Thomas Nielsen and uh, Frederick Dines worked on uh, INIAC and INSIC reactions in our institute. Uh, and uh, they uh, are reactions which is N-acetylaminium based. And here's shown a, a recent example of this, where we put on this uh, entity on the amino group. We reduce one of these two carbonyls uh, to the aldehyde, and then we get a uh, N-acetylaminium uh, reaction on this uh, aromatic compound to get us uh, this in the end. So that allows us to produce a whole combinatorial library of ligands very quickly. It's a quantitative reaction with complete uh, stereoselectivity. So we can make those ligands again to the melanocortin receptor, uh, or we can use them as here for the uh, cannabinoid receptor. And uh, this is what they are aimed for. We are not finished with this work yet, but it looks uh, very promising. So we have four different kinds of click reactions, uh, and they are based on different principles of a lot of gain uh, in enthalpy or entropy, or it can be loss of uh, nitrogen in this uh, uh, TCO reaction. So this is the reaction which I've not talked a lot about with the cyclooctene and the uh, uh, tetracene. So that's driven by loss of nitrogen, and these are uh, delta H, and this is delta H is driven. So any kind uh, of... Uh, you know, use of this uh, will, will be good. So uh, back to the mantras, because I think that uh, chemistry is everything, as I said, and uh, we should do research without constraints, and then uh, we should inspire our young people to choose chemistry, because chemistry is everything. So how do we do that? Uh, yeah, uh, well, I think that we should do a pleasure-driven uh, teaching using all the modern technologies of uh, videos and VRs and so on to uh, dive into the chemistry in the universe and show it, just create a visual world of this invisible world of chemistry for the first graders and second graders and so on. Let them have an experience to walk into our chemistry. Because, uh, and then we should not ask them to uh, you know, be able to remember any of it. They will. 
but uh, we shouldn't uh, force them to go to exams in this uh, from uh, first uh, first uh, year. And uh, we should start early, we should start positive, we should influence and imprint their identity with chemistry, because chemistry is everything. And uh, then we should excite them as much as we can. So we should combine this with some practical experiences as well. And we have a very good initiative by the life from uh, Novo Nordisk Foundation. So visualization before quantification uh, to evolve towards the natural sciences, because they store images so well. If you think back to your childhood, uh, some of you are older than others, and uh, if you are really old, then if you think back to your childhood, you will see very clear images of all the good experiences you had then. If you just go a couple of years back, it's a blur. You can't see anything there. <laughs> but the childhood images stands very clearly. So we should just uh, use all of those opportunities to get that done. And then we should uh, enforce serendipity in discovery, because all of the big discoveries happen because of uh, serendipity. And that means that we should think our rethink our funding uh, system again, because uh, we should fund based on performance and very short period of evaluation. I think every scientist should stand up for themselves and say, well, I allow somebody to evaluate me for my last three years of perform performance. If it wasn't good enough, maybe I should do something else. And then you get a free bag of money to do whatever you like for the next three years. I think that would be a perf perfect uh, way of funding, and it would save us so much effort and money. So the, we could then find new click chemistries that are green and work like uh, this one uh, for chemical solution to global ta challenges and uh, new research within our sustainable energy sources. So uh, if we do general education of students, it has a lot of impacts, not only on our uh, teaching and the number of chemists that choose here, uh, but also uh, it uh, provides uh, natural sciences and chemistry with a positive image rather than a negative one. Oh, there's chemistry in our food. Uh, general understanding uh, on the uh, consequences of what we do in political decisions and act uh, appropriately. We would vote according to this in our political systems. Um, so we can uh, get a better public debate and understand and avoid the properties and failures that we have um, and failures that we have in construction and now I'm particularly thinking about a, a construction near uh, my institute uh, and that uh, could give uh, chemistry a central role uh, already uh, is there in the Danish society uh, but it should have a more uh, focus central role from polit politicians because our whole economy in this region is uh, depending on chemistry, if you look at it. So uh, it would also allow you and me as individuals uh, to understand uh, the opportunities and limitations of uh, world resources and how to redistribute this in a more fair way. We would also uh, be able to use all this chemistry in our crafts, whether we are a baker uh, who makes a crust on bread or carpenter or a mason or a pharmacist, we can use this uh, knowledge to uh, live a more healthy life uh, and distinguish uh, nutrients from uh, poor quality food. Uh, so with that, I would just uh, like to thank, in particular, Klaus Bock for letting me be at Carlsberg Laboratory, Christian Tornö for his efforts with the click chemistry, and Mikhail Boltz for uh, inviting me to Copenhagen University. And then all the people who have been involved in click chemistry one way or another, and they are listed here. Uh, and then finally my family who has uh, accepted my behavior of uh, staying in the lab in the weekends or maybe even holidays uh, to, to complete this uh, stuff. So uh, with that, I would just like to thank you for... Oh, I don't know where that come from. 
so forget about that. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Morten, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And I see that why you are talking about this about images, I think it helps a lot uh, and the visualization of, of uh, chemistry. So, um, so that was very uh, exciting to see also in practice. Um, and uh, now there's time for questions, and we have two microphones here, one on each side. So maybe if you can indicate if you you have a question. Then uh, we will run up with the microphones. We are online, so it's important that we use the microphones. So, any questions? I dare say. <laughs> <laughs> then maybe I can start, uh, yes. Morten, uh, from coming also from DS, uh, Danish Institute for Advanced Study, where we work uh, with interdisciplinarity. And what I see here uh, with all the applications you have shown and all yeah, uh, the, the different topics you have been covering, how, how do you uh, deal with that interdisciplinarity? I mean, uh, That's is, is always been my problem, actually. I've always uh, you know, uh, diversified into too many areas, so I cannot cope with it. Mm. But that has been also advantageous. So. But is it, we often talk about how, how do you communicate, uh, with, I mean, with the methods, you come with different methods, you come with maybe also different ideas, and, and, and does it take extra time sort of yeah. to engage? I, I think you have to, as a researcher, I think it's extremely important that you have to challenge your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Don't stay in your comfort zone. <coughs> That's the worst place you can be <coughs> as a researcher. Uh, because a lot of the things that you develop, like the, what we've developed, uh, and there's a lot of things you haven't seen today, uh, but uh, those are actually in completely peripheral areas, building a new kind of machine that control c some chemistry or measure some images uh, in a different way, image analysis, uh, you know, a lot of different areas that are completely peripheral to this that we developed in our lab. And I think uh, it's important that you step out of your comfort zone, you don't know any idea, I don't have any idea of how to solve that particular problem, but you start looking at it and you uh, find out what to do. Eventually you learn how to program if that's what you need, or you learn a new kind of chemistry if that's what you need. You learn how to express proteins if that's what you need. <coughs> Good. Done. Uh, thanks for a wonderful talk. A quick question. I'm wondering, can we start to leave the uh, horseshoe crabs alone now with uh, I think this development? We, I think we should, but there's no, uh, I mean, it's a hundredfold more sensitive to bacteria in your blood. And particularly now where we have the staphylococcus that are meat-eating staphylococci, I think uh, it could be a good idea to test for bacteria if you have a, uh, you know, if you have an infection of some kind. Uh, I was very lucky last year, uh, a month before the uh, Nobel Prize was announced, I had a serious, serious stomach pain and I went in with a completely busted uh, appendix. Uh, and the uh, bacterial content of my blood was very high. I was very happy they could measure that, I would say. So I got an immediate operation because of that. Maybe they would have left me to the next day if they didn't have that analysis. So I think a lot of people were, uh, and you cannot make this artificially. So what do you do? But there is a problem because uh, they are uh, not as many as they were. They do die because we don't treat them correctly. I think it could be done. You could bleed them in a better way. It's your son or your mother, or it's uh, uh, the horseshoe crab. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, Oscar, Christine. Thank you very much, and for also for the 
bringing into the context nature and how it can be inspire <laughs> research and, and all your great words about independency and, and freedom of research. I, I uh, come from the medical field and uh, I loved all the ways this, is, this seems to be applicable for treatment development and, and so on. I was just wondering, it's a complete out of the box question but, and might be stupid, but does click chemistry ha happen anywhere naturally, spontaneously in no, nature? No, that's actually also when you hear Caroline Batosi's uh, Nobel lecture, she also points to this orthogonal universe. So she has the orthogonal toolbox, I call it, but she has a universe, uh, which is the biological one, and then she has an orthogonal universe, which is the click universe. Uh, and uh, they don't communicate because there's nothing uh, looking like an A-site in nature. So they used to, they need to be uh, perpendicular to each other in order to work as click chemistry. So do we understand all the clinical implications uh, of No, not them? yet, but I don't think that it looks uh, so bad because we have tested a lot of uh, the immunology of it and uh, we have tested uh, toxicity and it doesn't look like there's any in the, in the cases that we have looked at. I noted on one of your slides, just noting because I'm, I work with sex differences in health, and you had sexual something on your one of your slides. I was just wondering if that had any, if, if there are any sex differences in the application, or where, where did that kind of notion of sex suddenly uh, come into? One of these receptors, and I'm not entirely sure which one it is, uh, is involved in sexual dysfunction as described by literature, and that's all I know. I don't know exactly how that works. Um, the more important one is probably the memory one. Uh, we should not uh, interfere with that. Uh, memory is uh, controlled to a large degree by the melanocortin 5 receptor, it looks like. And uh, I think we should sort of stay away from that uh, when we try to treat obesity, for example. Okay. Any further questions? Oh, yeah, we take uh, yeah, we take you first, I thought. Yeah, thank you for a nice and inspiring talk. Uh, it, it's just a question that lies in a, a little bit in line with the previous question. So, if the click chemistry does not exist in nature, um, and you explain that uh, the compounds that has been provided to patients today, I, I believe that they did not raise an immunological uh, response, but do you know how they are excreted? Uh, or do you know how they are broken down up I, in our I'm body? I'm pretty sure that has been in investigated very, very thoroughly in this uh, clinical studies that I just pointed to, and that's just one out of 40 different drugs that is, is in clinic at the moment. So uh, I'm pretty sure we will know. Uh, and that's why we have clinical studies, in order to see if some moiety I'm sure you can find many uh, chemical moieties that are not present in nature in drugs uh, if you go back and look at it. Uh, chlorophenols, uh, you know, stuff like that. Okay, a question there. Yeah. Uh, so my question is more regarded to like the process of working with something that would eventually uh, receive a Nobel Prize, and uh, I was wondering if there was some point during your research where you felt like you were working on something that was, you know, worthy of a Nobel Prize. Never. Never. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it was just a complete surprise for you. It's always just been about the process, as you say. Yeah. Uh, about you know getting to the next step and solving the next problem, and uh, just like uh, research in general, our research is also building and building and building on things we already did. So you talk about this click reaction being a green reaction, um, but there has to be reactions to introduce uh, the A side and the alkyne, right? So, so how green are those reactions? Um, um, <laughs> well, uh, it's an aqueous reaction. Uh, it can be done in uh, water with a, a acetotransfer reagent. The acetotransfer reagent has to be prepared. Mm, I'm not sure how green I would call that reaction, but if you can have one reaction which can make it up for 
100 different pharmaceutical reactions, I think you're still better off. In particular because you're making a very small thing that you can then use to transfer the uh, A-site. Yeah? And, or you can make it by, by all, uh, biological means, right? Uh, because you can introduce these modified uh, uh, into proteins. We just need the mic uh, there, so there's a question there. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, since you talked about like uh, receptors and memory and such, do, does click chemistry have uh, a future in uh, prion disease treatment? Uh, we are working uh, not with prions, but we are working with Alzheimer uh, fibrils, and I definitely think it has a f future there. Uh, so we have uh, just... Uh, I just got a call from one of my master students uh, the day before yesterday that uh, our assay is working. <laughs> so uh, we can make Alzheimer fibrils and we can uh, prohibit their uh, precipitation uh, completely with our uh, clicked uh, and designed uh, peptides. So we design peptides that binds to the end of the growing uh, fibrils made of D-amino acids, so are not metabolically uh, unstable. And uh, we click them, and we have uh, something that really sits very well on the ends and prohibits the, uh, the growth of the fibrils. Uh, so that's one thing, and we also have something that processes the, uh, the then not uh, fibrilized uh, peptides. So that's uh, really cool. So Alzheimer is not really primes, but it's a similar, right? Any further questions? There's one up there. Hi. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk. I work here at the university with entrepreneurship in general. Can you maybe elaborate on what you think, how you create an environment where you can create big innovations such as the ones you have done? Yeah, so I, it's very hard. I tried actually to uh, file a patent on click chemistry uh, with Carlsberg, but uh, they looked a little bit on the patent and say this is not interesting. <laughs> this has nothing to do with beer. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's why there's no company on click chemistry in Denmark. <laughs> Otherwise there would be. Uh, but I think that if you have a good idea uh, and you just have to push it. There will be uh, people around you that are interested and uh, have the right connections. Uh, the, the main thing is to push it. Yeah. Uh, but it also has to be a viable idea, and uh, that's a very difficult thing. We just made a company four years ago uh, on these uh, beta hairpin kind of things, and uh, they bind, we can design them, and they bind extremely well to protein surfaces but not as well as uh, monoclonal antibodies. So that was the criterion that, that we had for the company that we should be able to beat uh, monoclonal antibodies, but they bind at femtomolar concentration. So it's really, really difficult to take a small molecule and make that uh, happen. So we couldn't continue that company because the financing was uh, depending on that. But it still works, I mean, uh, but it, it was not uh, good enough, so to speak. And I think you need to actually uh, make companies that are not good enough a lot of times before you make the one that really succeeds. And it's hard to say before, so you have to do it and then uh, see if it works. You cannot say this will work and this will not work. So it's a certain percentage of the companies that you make that will make a success. Question there. We continue on till. Um, yeah, Morten. I was really so, uh, amazed by the uh, amount of uh, <coughs> interesting reactions you could do with uh, uh, click chemistry. But I, I would like to comment on what you said that one should give uh, uh, money to uh, researchers for three years and let them do whatever they, they can. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you should uh, remind the politicians that in the mid-80s, you actually took part in, uh, in, in such a project where you were allowed to use the money like you, uh, in the way you wanted. Yeah. Uh, 
The only thing is that you need to be evaluated at the end of the three years. So if you didn't produce, you don't get the next uh, bag of money. And that was the difference with the 80s. Uh, because in the 80s, you were just allowed to do this. And then yeah, but started. anyway, I think uh, there was a good spin-off. There was you, and also here in, in ah. Rhodes, there was a yes, <laughs> 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 so. That's true. <laughs> Yeah, so what I want to say is that Morten is here until uh, half past, so there's still uh, some minutes. Don't hold back if you have questions for, for Morten. And any question will do. <laughs> you work quite a lot with uh, biological systems and cells. Have you given any thought to whether these uh, click reactions can be used uh, in vivo to synthesize new things by cells? Uh, they can, uh, but not with a, a lot of uh, copper one, or at least you need to uh, protect the cell from the copper one because the copper one will do the same kind of re, uh, uh, reactive oxygen species reactions in the cell, which is of course not usually anaerobic, it's uh, aerobic. So it will do the same kind of thing in the cell and you will have problems. Uh, so copper one is not uh, benign for cells. But the copper click, uh, copper free click uh, chemistry is benign and is used uh, a lot in cells uh, to do uh, ligation of big molecules inside a cell. Uh, that's uh, Peter G. Schulz has used click chemistry uh, in cells as, as a chemical reaction. And there's a cancer treatment now in uh, a clinical phase three which uses the tetracine uh, uh, octa. Uh, uh, what is cyclooctene reaction uh, to release a drug in cancer cells only. So what you do is you put one part of the click reaction onto the cancer cell first, label that, and then you come with uh, the other part of the click reaction connected with a, a cytotoxic drug. When it clicks, the cytotoxic drug is released into the cell. So that's a very selective cancer uh, cell treatment. Yeah. Uh, this is completely off the wall, but could, if click chemistry had a role in the uh, origin of life, I was thinking about reproducing. No, but molecules. we have something with Alzheimer that might. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, our, uh, we just, uh, uh, in the final stage of publishing, uh, a paper on Alzheimer peptides as order processing. So they form uh, conglomerates, these uh, kind of uh, global uh, things that are formed before the fibrils that are prolytically active and they process themselves. And uh, we think that there's a lot of information uh, storage in that uh, kind of process. Uh, you had it also with alpha, uh, uh, what is called synoclin, <coughs> yeah. uh, the, the tau proteins and so on. <coughs> Uh, they all seem to have this kind of process of self-regulation, uh, self self-processing. Uh, and that could be uh, part of the origin of life. <coughs> okay, yeah, there's a question here. Thanks. Uh, I'm just curious because at the end you mentioned uh, bakery and food. Yeah. So I do research with food science here. And I wonder how do you see click chemistry helping in food science? Uh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I think that food uh, science uh, is also chemistry to a very large extent. So uh, there are chemistries there. Maybe you can find a benign click reaction that you can use to decorate whatever food. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yes, should we say that is it? Uh, I don't see any other hands. Do you see that, Morten? I see one up here. Oh, oh there's one there. There are so many people here today, so it's yeah. very nice. Thank you, Martin. Um, I have a question about uh, enzyme research, because you mentioned about protease activity. Um, so what do you think, uh, because the efficiency also increased, as you can see from the uh, chile chemistry. So do you think this could be applicable for a lot of enzymes in terms of like a, uh, bringing together kind of thing, then it would make more efficient. Yeah, like. yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are actually having a whole program on that at the moment. 
uh, where we are using all sorts of amino acids and we synthesize uh, new enzymes uh, where we put them together by click uh, reactions. So we are making design of new <coughs> enzymes that can do uh, chemical reactions on uh, biomaterials. So, yes? <coughs> okay. So, um, should we give Morten a hand for addressing all these questions? Thank you, Odense. Yeah. <laughs>